I have a very conflicted relationship with Series 8 of Red Dwarf. At one time, it used to be unironically among my favourite series, but then I was probably about 14 or 15 at the time and fell right into the demographic this series seems to be pitching itself toward with its distinctly juvenile tone. Now that I've grown older and more mature, not only have my tastes changed, but I've come to see that a lot of what I thought was funny in my younger years is not funny at all and in some cases is downright harmful and offensive. And with this more refined critical lens, it gets harder to ignore the sexism, homophobia and other highly problematic aspects of Series 8, not to mention the structural issues in the writing which we're going to delve into in this video. Content warning for discussion of sexual harassment, assault and consent. The last time we covered Red Dwarf on this channel, we discussed how Series 7 marked a shift toward the show becoming more drama-focused and cinematic to varying degrees of success. Well, Series 8 veers in the opposite direction, with the emphasis now on lowbrow comedy comprised of slapstick and toilet humour. On the face of it, this change in artistic direction is a strange one, but then there are many strange things about Series 8. The opening story, Back in the Red, sees the entire original crew of Red Dwarf resurrected by nanobots and the main cast being put on trial and convicted of charges that don't make any sense and thrown into the brig, an onboard prison for transporting violent criminals that has been retconned into existence on board the industrial mining ship. If you're wondering why any of this is necessary given the existence of stasis pods as a core part of the show's premise, don't expect an explanation. I can only speculate that what must have happened here is Doug Naylor had this idea for a prison comedy series he wanted to do but couldn't find anyone to take him up on it so decided to make it a series of Red Dwarf instead, even if it makes no sense and barely feels like the same show anymore. Now don't get me wrong, I'm all for a shake-up of the format every once in a while. I mean, let's not forget the decision to confine the crew to Starbug for Series 6 produced some of the greatest episodes of the show. But the problem is, with so many recurring characters joining the cast like Ackerman, Captain Hollister and Kill Crazy, as well as the return of Rimmer and Holly, the lonely claustrophobia of the previous series is lost. And with less room to focus on each individual, some of the main characters inevitably get the short straw. Norman Lovett's Holly is no more than a device for dispensing one-liners, the cat might as well not be here, and Kachansky's character is a significant downgrade from the previous series. I'm not going to say she was brilliantly written before or anything, but at least the jokes didn't all revolve around her being the token female. Sure, that dynamic was there, but there was a bit more nuance to it, with her being a fish-out-of-water character due to her educated background putting her at odds with the rest of the dwarf's low-life antics. The way she is written in Series 8, by contrast, how can I put this, it's very r slash men writing women. To give you an example, in the episode Pete, the Dwarfers find a time wand device that can revert you physically back to an earlier point in your life, which incidentally I think is what must have happened to Doug Naylor when writing this series. And out of nowhere, Kachansky asks if it can do boob jobs. You see, it's funny because she's a woman and women have boobs. This is what I mean about the writing being geared toward 14-year-olds. I just can't help thinking of how unimpressed Sophie Isles was with the male gaze element of Series 7 on the Red Dwarf podcast, and I cringe at the thought of how she would have reacted if Adam and Philip had introduced her to this series. We're going to be delving into the sexism and the male gaze a bit more later, but first I want to talk about another weird aspect of the series, its inclusion of multi-part stories. Now even though Doug Naylor would abandon this experiment in subsequent series, making each episode stand alone, it's not necessarily an intrinsically bad idea in itself. It's just that the pacing of Series 8 and the decision of which stories to make into multi-parters is frankly bizarre. The series opener, Back in the Red, is spread out over three parts and features, among other things, an extended sequence involving the cat and a line of CGI dancing blue midgets that is looked at by many as Red Dwarf's jumping the shark moment. The mid-series two-parter, Pete, is equally padded out and does little to justify its length. Meanwhile, the finale, originally planned to be two episodes, is a rushed and disjointed mess, as the main characters spend the first half of the runtime pulling juvenile pranks on each other before Naylor suddenly remembers this is supposed to be the final episode and introduces a corrosive microbe that is destroying the ship. But if structural issues were the only thing Series 8 had going against it, then I'd be far more lenient in my overall judgement. Unfortunately though, we now have to get into the uncomfortable stuff. 
Now I'm going to preface this by saying that lowbrow risque humour in itself is not necessarily problematic or even bad. For instance, the subplot in Pete about Crichton making himself a penis and naming it Archie I do find genuinely funny, even if it is yet more needless filler in an already terribly paced story. But it's all about the way in which it is framed and where the punchline lands. What I'm getting to here, and there's no way of saying this comfortably, is that Doug Naylor seems to think, or at least he did at the time of writing this series, that non-consensual sex, just as a concept in of itself, is absolutely hilarious. To be fair, some of it may have been the influence of his co-writer, Paul Alexander, I don't know, but either way, it's concerning to say the least. One of the episodes, Crity TV, involves the main characters watching a voyeuristic show of the women showering without their consent, and Lister's explanation for why he went along with this is that he couldn't help himself. So basically pulling from the Joss Whedon handbook of excuses. So much for him being the character of strong moral principles. Perhaps more troublingly, in Back in the Red, he appears perfectly okay with the idea of using what amounts to a date rape drug to take advantage of Kachansky in another scenario that naturally is played for laughs. The sexual magnetism virus was first introduced as a throwaway gag in series 5, in what is a good example of where the earlier series knew where to draw the line and when to stop. Because although it might be an amusing concept, like any kind of love potion MacGuffin, it raises a lot of troubling questions about consent which can't really just be ignored if you take it too far. The fact that it is used almost exclusively by men on women just adds another level of yikes. I say almost exclusively because there is the closing scene in which Lister pours the virus over Rimmer in front of his fellow inmates. Now serious talk here, this is one of the single most repulsive things I have ever seen in any piece of media, and I don't care if humour is subjective. If you try to defend this scene then you are a sick twisted excuse for a human being. Not only is the punchline that someone is about to be raped, but I think the clear implication here is that of course the other inmates would be attracted to Rimmer, because they're scummy, low-life, sexually deviant criminals, even though no other men had been shown to be affected by the virus up until this point. So this scene is also homophobic. Now you might think all of this is excessively harsh, but there is a good reason for it. For millions of women living in the UK and other parts of the world, sexual harassment and assault is something you just have to live with on a daily basis, and if you don't believe that is true, then you haven't been listening. I'll link a blog post in the description by my friend Izzy if you want a first-hand account of just how rampant the problem is. The point is, this casual, laid-back attitude toward the idea of boundaries and consent has real-world consequences. It's one of the very worst aspects of toxic masculine culture, and hence when I see it reflected in media, I have a very low tolerance. Being taken advantage of is not funny. Men perving on women is not funny. Someone about to be assaulted is not funny funny. These things are horrific and disturbing, and to try to frame them as anything else is at best irresponsible. Now, for all that I've just said, I don't hate Series 8, or at least not all of it. As alluded to before, some of the jokes, even the more juvenile ones, do still genuinely make me laugh. I just think Doug Naylor could have really benefited from someone to reel him in and tell him what is and is not appropriate and when to stop, and I really hope that he has since matured and seen the error of his ways, because honestly, this kind of shit is not just a black mark on Doug's career, but on his character as a person. This is Midnight Chimes, still waiting for the last train home.